coming out in the rain. I was just saying to somebody, I, I gave away all my umbrellas, so, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, you can't offer whatever. Uh, my name's Matt Guffman. I'm the assistant principal here at Eleanor Roosevelt, and uh, I want to, Mr. Saliani, who is the principal, is out giving a reward to one of our teachers, so he couldn't be here. But it is my pleasure to welcome you here uh, in the rain, and all along with our guests, uh, to the, this event tonight. Um, we're really excited to have you here, and, you know, we love hosting hosting events and, uh, you know, having you here and just coming into the school, we're really proud of this place and um, a lot of our success is, is really due to some of these individuals up on the stage, so we really thank them. Uh, you know, just, uh, I was asked to introduce the event, so this is the um, uh, Excelsior Scholarship Forum, where I believe you're going to be uh, afforded the opportunity to, to hear about uh, scholarship, and I know it's kind of a great opportunity. To, some free, free tuition for some of the uh, New York City schools, and you'll hear quite a bit about that. Um, you know, one of the one of the commonalities I think with everybody on stage and in this school, just to say a little bit, is is really can be summed up in kind of like one word, and that is like opportunity. And I think that you know our our focus in providing opportunities for not just high achievers but all students, and and especially with our work this year with equity, you know, trying to target students that aren't doing so well and maybe don't quite have the aptitude to do as well and I will focus on them and providing them with opportunities to, to succeed and really to, to excel and I think you know the scholarship is, is in line with that and offers those same opportunities so you know thanks for coming out. Um, so the first speaker is uh, Councilmember member Ben Kalos who's been a great supporter and, and you know great person for our school so thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> I want to first start by, by thanking the most important people in this room, which is all of you who braved the weather uh, to come in this evening, so we can just, uh, all of us who thank you very much for coming out tonight. We do all of this for you. I, I want to thank my colleagues on the state level, our state senator, Liz Krueger, our state assembly member, Rebecca Seawright, uh, for making the Excelsior, uh, Excelsior Scholarship happen with the governor. Uh, they are his partners in Albany, uh, and, and sometimes other times just pushing him, uh, especially our, our state senator. But uh, when I was running for city council in 2013, everyone wants to know what your ideas are. I put out a policy book, and one of the ideas was just we could make the CUNY schools free using something called forgivable debt. Uh, but the problem is there was just too much debt out there. And uh, the governor was able to one-up that idea of free CUNY by making SUNY ostensibly free. Uh, using the Excelsior Scholarship and versus where I was suggesting to just do a loan uh, that was forgiven if people stayed living here, it, he created a scholarship for people who went to school and stayed. And so uh, he and our state elected officials really deserve the credit for getting it done. But having gotten it done, we want to make sure that as many people take advantage of it as possible. And that's why we have this great panel of folks here to understand both the Excelsior Scholarship, but also a lot of other great government programs that can help you afford college. Uh, and we really hope that everyone has access to college. And so uh, our, our state senator, again, is, is the ranking member on the uh, Finance Committee. Uh, and, the, and on the Higher Ed Committee. And on the Higher Education Committee. And she's been fighting this fight long before I was an elected official. And for our assembly member, she got elected and this got done. And it so happens that CUNY may run in her family. Uh, so she also deserves a lot of credit, both her and her family. So uh, it is a pleasure to do this. I need to apologize that I need to step out. I have to go to, I think, three or four community meetings this evening to talk about uh, the ballot. Uh, in November, there's going to be something on the back of the ballot. And I'm hoping that you will flip over your ballots. Yes, I think Brain kept a lot of the people who said they were coming away tonight um, 
climate change will be our next discussion. <laughs> the next one and our next one. Um, I just want to quickly highlight that my office did update our guide to paying for college, and there are copies out there on the way you came in. So please feel free to take one. They go over the basics of some of the programs you're going to hear about here tonight, uh, but also just to highlight that the state, in addition to the new Excelsior Scholarship Program, um, which is critically important, but I actually think we can do better and make it better, and that can be a discussion with whoever will probably be in the governor did this year again. Um, but we also have fabulous education opportunity programs, higher ed opportunity program, SEEK, College Discovery, um, the Collegiate STEM program, some of the honors program. There's many different programs to learn about and to look into when exploring what your options in New York State for going to college are and how to make them more affordable. So please feel free to take a look through the book. Um, and again, as we already learned, um, many of the high schools who take their job seriously are doing their own presentation as well on the different options and issues. No one who goes to high school in New York should think there's no options for them to be able to find a college program that both is a good match with them academically and career directed for them and also affordable. We have a long way to go to try to prevent people from having to graduate with enormous debt and that is still a serious, serious issue we need to help and confront. But I think New York State is working hard to offer more and more options to young people because we want you all to have a great education. We want you to be able to stay in New York and continue your life and your careers and build your own families staying right here in New York. So I do want to thank our panelists, who I will allow my colleague, not in crime, but in government, uh, Rebecca Seawright, to do the introduction. But I want to thank them all for coming out here tonight. And also, like Ben, I have multiple community meetings, which may or may not be the same as his, so I'll also be excusing myself. Rebecca Seawright. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to stand out of that, that line there as well. So good evening. I'm Assembly Member Rebecca Seawright. I'm honored to represent you in the New York State Assembly. My district runs from East 61st Street to East 92nd Street east of 3rd Avenue, for those of you that live in that catch-all area. Um, I have two kids that went through the public school system and are now in the public higher ed uh, university system. This past year in Albany, I voted for a $7.6 billion increase in higher education in New York State, an increase of $1.5 billion since 2012. New York is in phase two of the Excelsior Free Tuition Program. There's a lot of uh, work that's needed to expand that program, but this is a start. For 2019, 2019, the scholarship income eligibility has increased, allowing New Yorkers with household incomes of up to 110,000 to be eligible. Um, I want to introduce our panelists this evening, and thank you for coming out, and thank all of you for braving rainy weather tonight. Um, we have Michael St. John Turner, Client Relations Manager at Higher Education Services. Right there, just raise your hand. Dr. Kelly Brennan, Vice President for Enrollment Management and Student Services at the Fashion Institute of Technology, SUNY. Alex L. Hellu, Admissions Counselor and EOP Coordinator at SUNY Maritime College. Brian Smarsh, Counselor for the Excelsior Program at Westchester Community College. And Mark Scioli, University Director of Recruitment at the City University of New York, CUNY. Jeff Strecker, Executive Director, Student Services, representing the Commission of Independent Colleges and Universities. So thank you all for being here. And I will turn it over to you, and we look forward to hearing you. So, um, hello everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight to um, hear about our programs. Um, I'm going to talk about the Excelsior Scholarship. I represent the state agency that's in charge of administering the program. Um, a little agency that's called New York State Higher Education Services Corporation, or HESC. You see our little logo down there. 
Um, most people aren't familiar with who we are until you get to this point when your children reach um, the age where you start exploring college options, you're thinking about how you're going to pay for it, you start to learn that New York offers a variety of opportunities to help, including now the latest addition to our programs, which is called the Excelsior Scholarship. So um, we actually offer over 20 different grant scholarship and student loan forgiveness opportunities um, on behalf of the state. So it's not only just this wonderful opportunity to get free tuition, but oh, you're going right. Perfect. Uh, it's also well, uh, can't use the volume change. It's um, also what we can do in terms of providing additional support. So we have loan forgiveness opportunities. We also uh, provide oversight in the state's 529 college savings program. For those of you who have younger children, I have two little ones at home that I use that program. It's a wonderful program that we use to save for our children's higher education expenses. And you know everything kind of in between of helping families understand this process and navigate what's a complicated financial aid system. So I'm going to focus my conversation on um, some of our programs, highlighting the Excelsior Scholarship, but also the sister program to Excelsior, which you know doesn't get enough fanfare. And my colleague Jeff is going to be talking about how it works at his school called the Enhanced Tuition Award, or ETA for short. So um, we have to first start at the beginning. When we talk about our programs, we're looking at um, filing for financial aid. Typically happens during 12th grade, senior year. Oftentimes begins with the filing of the FAFSA application, which is a federal form. Stands for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Starts, uh, just came out last week, October 1st. FAFSA is a prerequisite to applying for New York's need-based aid programs, meaning that any program where we have income restrictions, you have to first file a FAFSA to qualify. New York is actually, it's, it's um, kind of unique because New York offers both types of opportunities here in New York State, meaning that we have programs that are restricted to your income, like the Excelsior Scholarship where there's an income cap, but we also have merit-based scholarships and programs that can reward students who have done significantly well in school. Some of those programs include the aforementioned STEM incentive scholarship. We have scholarships for you know, people who are interested in teaching and social service. There are all types of different programs that we have beyond Excelsior. But Excelsior, because of the opportunity that we offer in New York being the first state in the nation to offer free tuition at our public colleges and universities for both the two-year and the four-year degree. So there are a few other states that right now offer a, a model of free tuition community college New York actually goes further than that. We go into the bachelor's degree, so there's a lot of excitement about that opportunity. So I'll explain how that works. So if you're seeking the Excelsior Scholarship opportunity, first you have to complete your FAFSA application at the point in which you're required to do so during senior year. Following that application, there's a form called the TAP application. And TAP has been a program that's sort of been, I think, thrown to the side nowadays, but it's been a very important, long-standing grant program in New York. It's been around since the 1970s, so well over 40 years we've been uh, helping families with tuition assistance for those who qualify to help with tuition not only at our public colleges and universities but also at our private schools. So you can get a TAP grant, we'll call that tuition assistance program TAP for short. The TAP grant you can get it at CUNY, SUNY, you can get it at uh, private schools like Mercy, you can get it at even the Columbia or Cornell, as long as the school's located in New York, you could potentially benefit from TAP. For some of our lower, lower income New Yorkers, the TAP program has what I call now been the original tuition-free program in New York. Because for our most low-income applicants, the TAP program actually provides free tuition at our state and city universities in combination with something called the SUNY CUNY tuition credit. So when you receive a TAP award, you could potentially be eligible to get the first you know, certain amount of your tuition covered by the TAP award. And for those families who qualify for the highest level of the benefit, could actually get free tuition. So we have students that go to WCC get free tuition via TAP. We have students who go to SUNY FIT get free tuition via TAP. Over 60% of students that go to CUNY schools, where my colleague Mark is going to represent, actually benefit for, uh, to a high level from the TAP award and receive significant support. So, you know, I only say this because sometimes I think we look specifically at what, what Excelsior is doing. Excelsior is a complementary program to the TAP program, saying that first we see can we help families through our TAP grant and then for those families who don't receive the full coverage of the TAP award, who are not able to get free tuition, um, can have this opportunity to supplement the TAP award by applying for the Excelsior Scholarship. So who would these families be? Well, typically to qualify for a TAP award, you have to have an adjusted gross income that's under $80,000. That's been the traditional high income range of, of the TAP award is families who make toward $80,000. You would typically get, um, it's a scaled benefit, so you would get the lower amount of the TAP award. That lower amount, to be honest with you, is $500. So potentially, if you make close to $80,000, you might get $500 in tuition assistance. So a lot of families weren't happy with that. 
If you happen to mention it to me, I was joking around with my colleagues, we'll probably, uh, I'll ask for it back. I'll say, give me the $500, I'll be happy to accept it. So it's part of what you can get. The governor and the, the state legislature, the assembly, you know, the, the state senate, they you know, have this program now, Excelsior, which now adds to that. So if a family's only getting $500 in TAP, you're not getting as much support as you need at our uh, SUNY and CUNY schools. You're not getting as much support as you'd like to get at private schools. You can supplement that TAP award by applying for Excelsior at SUNY and CUNY or the Enhanced Tuition Award at a, uh, a participating private school. So what does Excelsior do? It guarantees the remainder of tuition covered on behalf of the state with a, with a contribution that's made through SUNY and CUNY, a similar program with TAP where there's a credit that's given that's added to the scholarship that gives you the remainder of your tuition for free. The, the families that can qualify for this Excelsior Scholarship or Enhanced Tuition Award benefit are those who have adjusted gross incomes, depends on when you're applying. If you're a student who's going to be applying to college the next school year, the 2019-2020 school year, that AGI cap is going to reach 125000 Meaning if your federal AGI off of the 2017, because that's going to be the year that you're using right now to file for financial aid for the next school year, uh, the 2017 AGI was at or under 125000 the children in your household would be uh, beneficiaries of the Excelsior Scholarship. They could apply for it and they would receive it. But how much they get is contingent on what other financial aid they get. Um, last year there was a lot of excitement about Excelsior, so much so that a lot of low-income families also applied for the program. And we're disappointed to find out that the state didn't award them any Excelsior monies. It wasn't because we didn't want to, it was because they were already benefiting from the TAP program where their tuition was already covered on behalf of that program. Or they were receiving a combination of federal, state, and monies being provided by the college or private scholarship funding where their tuition was already covered. So the Excelsior Scholarship is what we call a last mile program. It's giving families what's missing in their aid programs in order to get them the remainder of their tuition covered for free. It only covers tuition, so Excelsior is not a program that could be stacked, and some people said, well, hey, I have that cool TAP award for $5,000, can I add the $5,000 from Excelsior, now I have $10,000, and I can maybe get some help living on campus. The Excelsior scholarship is meant to be used specifically for tuition, and to fill the gap of what's not being covered by your other financial aid programs that could provide for tuition. So be careful when you're applying for Excelsior, because if you're a family who's already receiving a significant aid offer, um, that where your tuition is provided for and then some, you, you can apply for Excelsior, you can theoretically be accepted into the program but not be awarded any monies because of your existing financial aid. So with the Excelsior program, um, if you qualify for it, and typically the families that we're targeting are those families that don't really benefit from the TAP award, they don't really benefit uh, from the Pell Grant program which is offered through FAFSA. So those families are usually those families in that range, 90, 100,000, 110,000, 120,000, where they file a FAFSA, they file for TAP, and they usually don't receive any free grant money. You would be a well-qualified Excelsior recipient, and maybe Excelsior will be the, the main state program that you receive to help get free tuition. If you accept the Excelsior Scholarship, and typically the Excelsior program has a separate application that needs to be filled out, separate from the FAFSA, separate from the TAP application, it's done later in senior year, so there's a separate application for Excelsior, just like there's a separate application for the Enhanced Tuition Award Program for the private schools. You can fill out that additional application usually in the spring of senior year. We released it last year for the graduating seniors. It, it uh, opened up from March and it ended in July. So that's typically the uh, range where we think we're going to open it up every year. It's a limited application period. It has to be applied for on our website. And there's a handout about the Excelsior Scholarship that they had um, on the table. So we hope you got that as you came in which has that info, and so you want to make sure you apply because if you miss the application window, you might not be able to join the program. Um, you'll be excluded from the program for that time. You're welcome to apply for Excelsior at any point. It's not a program where you need to be a graduating high school senior to apply. You can apply for it as a second year college student, as a third year college student, but the requirements are important to know because you may apply for it later in school, but you may not meet the qualifications if you're joining the program midstream while you're in school. So there are two important things you need to know about the Excelsior Scholarship. So we know it provides free tuition, we've covered that. We know it's, it's giving us last dollar money that help us close the gap in tuition, which our other aid may, or may not cover. But it's also incentivizing on-time graduation. Both the Excelsior Scholarship and the Enhanced Tuition Award has sort of what I call the in-school academic requirement, is that if a student is a beneficiary of, of ETA or Excelsior, they have to have an on-time pathway to graduation and they have to demonstrate that they're taking the necessary amount of credits every year to have that pathway to graduate based on the length of their degree program. 
So if a student's in a four-year degree track, typically that's 120 credits. If you divide that over four years, the state's going to require that the student earn at minimum 30 credits per year in order to advance in the program in a future year. So um, 30 credits per year while the student's in college is the minimum academic requirement. We're not looking at grade point average, um, so we're not asking the student to be an A average or a B average. We're just asking them to take classes and pass those classes with whatever minimum passing grade is allowed by the school to earn credit to demonstrate that you have enough credits to meet the 30 credit criteria. Those 30 credits we hope traditionally would be taken across the fall and spring semesters, meaning that students would take 15 in the fall, 15 in the spring if they could. But credits could be made up elsewhere during intercessions, if the college offers intercessions like winter or summer. But the Excelsior Scholarship does not pay for intercession study. It doesn't pay for your summer classes if you're missing a class. It doesn't pay for your winter session class. Now, something that families aren't aware of, you know, I used to work at a private school before I joined um, uh, the state. And um, our families were taking 15, 18 credits per semester because usually we, what's called block tuition charging. You pay for up to 18 credits, but if students are only taking 12, you're kind of losing money. So we're advising families that to get the bang for your buck, the student should be attempting more credits. But also mathematically speaking, if the student's doing the minimum full-time course load of you know, 12 credits, if you add those numbers up, you need four and a half years to graduate from college. You need more time. More time spent in school is more money out of family's pocket. Uh, four years typically is the expiration period of, of a TAP award. You can't get TAP past four years, eight, eight full-time semesters. Four years, if you're paying an extra semester, an extra year for your child to be in college, that's an extra year of housing that you might be paying at the school uh, because they are you know, delayed in graduating on time. So the state really wants to incentivize on-time completion. So 30 credits minimum across four years, you get in, you get out of college, you get that degree. We do allow some um, use of transferable AP, IB credits, pre-college credit that may be able to fill some gaps. If you have some, let's say one semester, one year you come out with 24 credits, you don't want to take summer classes. But you know, like a school here at Elro, the students take a lot of pre-college credits. If those are allowed to be transferred into the school based on the school's policy, the school can utilize those credits to fill the gap. So six college, six acceptable transferable AP credits can get you to 30 if you're only coming out with 24 from freshman year. So it's what we call a safety net. And you can use that throughout the years that you're in school. So that's, that's an opportunity that they can give you with advanced study if you're taking any sort of uh, pre-college courses as part of being a high school student to give yourself a little bit of, of a safety net. So that's the first big requirement. If the students do not meet their 30 credits, they will lose the program, and they can lose the program even as soon as the spring semester of their freshman year if they determine that by the end of that period, after that one year is up, they don't have their 30 credits, the state's not going to allow them to receive even the second payment of their Excelsior Scholarship program, and you would have to owe tuition for the uncovered amount of tuition that the Excelsior Scholarship would have covered uh, based on not meeting the 30 credit requirement. You'd also lose any future eligibility for Excelsior uh, unless there's a special circumstance. The state does allow appeals, and so we want to make sure that you um, um, notify us if something does happen, that you can't make it 30 credits because you get sick or something like that. Second big requirement that I want to talk about in the time that I have remaining that some, for some people they feel is controversial um, is the post-award residency. New York is asking former ETA and Excelsior recipients to live in New York State uh, for the same duration of time that they receive the benefit. So if you got four years of free tuition to go to Hunter College, the expectation would be that if you got that through Excelsior, that you would be remaining in New York for four years after graduation. Remaining in New York and maintaining New York residency is the only requirement. I've seen this misreported in the media that you make your children get jobs, they have to work, they have to do this, or else. It's basically the state, all states do this. This isn't a new thing. This isn't unique to New York. It's called brain drain. The state spends money to keep their best and brightest students here, and the goal is, is not just to give you financial aid you know, to help you pay for college, but also to encourage the, um, the advancement of the state population, to get more degrees into people's hands, to give more people the opportunity to get the jobs that require those degrees. Students have to meet that residency requirement. They do sign a contract as part of the Excelsior Scholarship application and as part of the ETA application to that effect. If they do not live in New York for the required amount of time, and we do make allowances, you know, if a student gets accepted to Harvard Law School, we will give them a postponement, you know, go get your law degree at Harvard, we'll give them nine months after they graduate Harvard Law School to come back to New York, find a place, and resume living here. So there are allowances, we're not restricting your kids from any temporary opportunities, but if they leave the state and they don't plan on coming back, 
They can owe back a portion or the entire amount of their scholarship depending on how long did they stay. So let's say, for example, the student got 43 years of tuition to go to Baruch College in CUNY. They stayed after graduating Baruch for two out of the four years. Well, they can keep their first two years of Excelsior because they met two years of living in New York. The last two years of Excelsior would have to be paid back to the state. Zero interest, zero penalties, zero fees. The state is not making money off of these young people who don't happen to make the requirement. I see it misreported in the media that we're going to ding your kids with um, you know, all these fees and penalties for leaving the state. Basically, the state invested money in you to stay in New York. You didn't meet that full requirement, and the state would want a return on what you didn't qualify to keep because you didn't meet the full duration of residency. We give students 10 years to make payment arrangements to pay that money back. Only the portion of tuition that Excelsior's scholarship was covering, they would owe us back, depending on how long did they stay. So um, those, that's kind of you know, the outline of the program. We have other speakers who are going to address you know, any holes or things that I missed. Uh, and of course, we're going to be here for your questions. So we're going to transition now to the SUNY folks. Um, and uh, Thank you. pass the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am Kelly Red from uh, Fashion Institute of Technology. Uh, in addition to representing FIT, I'm actually here with a welcome from our colleagues at SUNY. Uh, in particular, we have a um, welcome center on 42nd Street and 6th Avenue in the optometry building, uh, which is a wonderful resource in addition to our individual campuses. So uh, thank you for having us here. Uh, SUNY is committed to affordability as a representative of the state. We have 64 campuses across the state. Um, there are four or five uh, technical colleges in the five boroughs. FIT is one of them, Maritime uh, is another, uh, Downstate, and Optometry. Uh, we complement the education in the city you get from uh, the City University of New York. In addition, we have wonderful colleagues up all through Long Island, like Westchester, uh, and across the state. Uh, the thing about SUNY is students can pursue associates and bachelor degrees in four different types of uh, colleges, and the tuition that the state assists us with is actually set at two different rates. So quite often, um, students will look at community colleges to look for the tuition that's about $1,200 less than a four-year institution where you start at a bachelor rate. Uh, and I point this out because there's many ways to get um, both through school in an affordable way, as well as um, various opportunities to start in different types of schools and move around. But when we talk about that, you also always have to worry about um, continuing to meet your financial aid requirements like TAP and Excelsior. Uh, a plug for FIT, we are founded as a community college uh, but in 1971, we're allowed by the state to teach uh, and award bachelor degrees and master degrees. So our students start in the first two years and earn an associates and pay the associates rate, and then they transfer to the upper division and they pay the bachelor rate. So there's many creative ways uh, to get through school in an affordable way. Um, and I'm going to actually catch up and turn the mic over first to my colleague from financial aid at Westchester Community College, who can talk about how we apply all the various aid uh, across the system, right? right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Smarsh. I'm financial aid advisor at Westchester Community College. I am also the Excelsior certified official. And uh, it's always good to, to come to the high schools and talk about financial aid and college choice prior to uh, your students entering the school. Uh, it's important because whether, there used to be, uh, college used to be considered, for the baby boomers and older, college was considered a humanistic uh, endeavor. You got an education and you figured out what you were gonna do with your career after you got your education. But your education was a golden ticket. Like you went to college, that really meant something and the world was open to you. The world has changed from Generation X to the Millennials to uh, Generation Z, I believe they're called. But then, uh, going to college is an investment in your future earnings. Getting the education is still part of it, and in a perfect world it would still be a humanistic endeavor. It is, hello? It is not. 
So it's important to understand that although what you are, the experience you have in college, the, the exper I don't need it. The experience that you have in college will deter will have great impact on your worldview, and you'll be introduced to different cultures and different peoples and all that. Although other wonderful things that ex that you experience when you go to college, it is still primarily a consumer choice. It is a purchase. You're investing in your education. And it is up to you, as a financial aid counselor, I, I see horror stories every day of students who have overextended themselves and used up their financial aid, and suddenly they don't know what to do with themselves and they don't have a way to pay for college. As was mentioned earlier, you apply. You can apply for financial aid literally right now. Either I was looking on the um, Twitter feed of the Department of Education, and there's an app for that. You can apply for your FAFSA right over your phone in an app. You can download it and go to Starbucks and fill out a FAFSA. What a wonderful world, right? The thing is, is that um, then you have the opportunity to apply for TAF. And when, is it, when it is announced, you'll have the opportunity to apply for Excelsior. The key to uh, financial aid is that you want to minimize your debt as much as possible. Now that will seem, uh, the subtext is that I as a SUNY uh, representative am saying you should only go to a SUNY or a CUNY. And the ant is not the case. But what you should do is you should use the SUNY and the CUNY and the community college tuitions as your baseline. You want to match that as much as possible while still gaining the, ex the incredible experience of attending an NYU or a Columbia. You have to let if your student is eligible to go to those great schools, you have to go to them and say, hey, what can you do for me before you make the choice? Because there's a lot of pressure to look at a brand name school and say, wow, I went to Columbia. Okay, that's great. Joe, $200,000. Is that a good thing? No. Um, and from a statistical point of view, the research doesn't necessarily support that going to one of these brand name institutions has this long-term benefit to your um, long to your prospects economically. There is, the best that we can determine as educators is that there's a positive correlation between attending one of these schools for five years. That there's some benefit, and for some students, they will benefit more than others. However, in terms of psychology, it, that's called self-selection. These people are very motivated, they got really good grades, they would probably be doing just as well in life if they went to another school. So it isn't necessarily that you can demonstrate, we can't necessarily prove that going to one of these incredibly expensive institutions automatically guarantees that you're going to have all these opportunities if you didn't attend another college. How about job, uh, job recruitment? Uh, again, there's a positive correlation for five years. That's the only thing we can demonstrate. It's a very good question. If you have, it's, the CUNYs are an especially good example of that because I had a student at WCC whose grades were outstanding and she got like a 4.0, she was in honors classes, she was an accounting uh, graduate and she wanted to attend Columbia. And I'm like, well, we have CUNY Baruch. Their, out, their accounting program is outstanding and you get a really good internship because we're right in the middle of everything. We're in New York City. Right, but that's the exception. But that's self-selection. She would have succeeded no matter where she went because she was incredibly motivated. And she ended up, I had a friend who had an accounting office in Westchester County. They needed a new accountant. I referred her there. It's much more about who you know, and that's where the benefit <coughs> primarily of these incredibly expensive institutions is in that you can network. Well, you can network at other colleges as well. You will have an easier time of it. It's all about, it's all about calculating the costs and comparing the benefit versus the long-term obligations. If your student is really motivated, gets into a really good school, and they have a financial aid package that makes it worthwhile that you're just like, we can handle this, that's a separate issue. But if you're looking at it and your child is like, I have to go to the school, no. You're the, I speak primarily, when I speak at this particular point, I'm speaking to the parents here. Because you're the adults in the room. You're going to make the decision and understand the long-term consequences in a way that your student is not. So it's really important that you have serious conversations about what you can afford to do and what you can't afford to do. Now, if I may speak on Excelsior for just one moment. Um, as was uh, uh, stated by my colleague here, 
The trick is not qualifying for it, the trick is keeping it. Because it has, uh, it has requirements that regular financial aid doesn't have. But Excelsior isn't technically financial aid. It's a scholarship. Two little words that sound the same but have a huge difference in meaning. Um, the other thing is, is that there is, uh, for, to be a full-time student, yeah, if you take remedial courses, remedial courses do not count you as a full-time student. So I'll give you an example. We have, um, we have a lot of first year, uh, first uh, generation college students, students whose uh, first language is not English. They need to take remedial courses. They're going to have to make up some of those courses to keep their money. If your student has a disability and works with the disability office of your school, that will exempt them from taking full time plus remedial course. If you have that, you must document it. You must, you must ask for help. You cannot get that retroactively done and say, hey, I have disability when you haven't done very well. So it's important, and that is a big part of the, of when you're applying for a waiver, you have to be able to document everything. So it's, it's important. Uh, the other thing is, is that we were talking about tuition. When you qualify for the Excelsior program, your tuition is frozen at last year's rates. Um, not a big difference for WCC, it's 50 bucks, but for the SUNYs and the CUNYs, it can be quite substantial. So you want to keep that scholarship. If you speak a foreign language, get it, take the CLEP exam, free college credits. Take the high school courses, take college courses here in high school, go to pre-college programs, bank those courses so that you have the opportunity to keep this money, graduate on time, or even early. And this way you don't have to repay anything, and it's a wonderful opportunity, and a lot of our students are making very good use of it. Some, eh, not so much. The other thing is, and I'm um, not sure how much time I have left, we're using what's called prior prior. It used to be that if you, for the 1819, we should use the 17 taxes. But for 1819, we're using the 16 taxes. What is that? That's called prior prior to allow people to apply much, much earlier and to ensure that they have their taxes done. A lot of, a lot of schools have requirements that their financial aid application be done in January. And that their taxes aren't ready yet because they own their own business, they took a, you know, they took the six months extension. Now it's because it's a year and a half backward, everybody will have their taxes done. That does, because it's two years prior, it means that it may not reflect your present economic standing. State of New York has a new program where you can show certain life-changing experiences where you can have your financial aid application adjusted. It's called the Professional Judgment Income Adjustment. Income adjustment. You have to apply for your financial aid as normal, use the correct information, but then you go to your financial aid office and you say, hey, this is what happened. I was looking at something today where a, uh, a father who was an, uh, um, a construction worker, he was very badly injured, he hadn't worked in two years, but because we're using the 15 taxes, it did not accurately reflect that I was able to help him. All right. Also, remember that if there's a change in program, you can always go to your college, to the private colleges, and say, hey, this is no longer the case. Can you give me more? Can you give me more money? Can you give me more scholarship money? There's always opportunities to help. Um, we'll have a question and answer period. Uh, if you have any questions that you don't want to talk about with me in the beginning, uh, you know, want to talk to me in private, grab me outside. I'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Ovalu. I'm with SUNY Maritime. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about the opportunity programs. Uh, so SUNYs have something called EOP, Education Opportunity Program. Uh, CUNYs have something called C for four-year programs, CD for two-year programs, and private schools have something called EGOP. They're all essentially the same thing, just different acronyms. Basically, you would look at the household size and it correspond with um, household income. If you're in significant need, schools will offer you additional support academically and financially. So they'll pay for your, um, for your tuition, they'll help you with that. To help you with your meal plan, to help you with uh, room and board. Depending on the school, depending on funding, it may cover all of it, it may cover some of it. Um, different schools have different cohort sizes. For example, SUNY Maritime has a cohort of 16 to 22, depending on the year. Uh, Buffalo has about 200. So it really depends on the amount of students that attend the school um, so that they can give them funding. Um, so some other supports they get are academic support, so they get their own advisor. They also get free tutoring. Um, another way to indicate whether or not you qualify, some high schools, some students will get free or reduced lunch. 
that's something that can help you also apply for school. So if you get free or reduced lunch, you get waivers. Waivers to apply for school, uh, and waivers for SAT and ACT. Uh, so those are some things that can assist students to get into college. Um, I guess I can pass it over to Jeff. Yeah, okay. Thank you guys. Good evening everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. My name is Mark Cioli, the University Director of Recruitment at CUNY. Uh, I'd like to get a sense of the audience. How many of you, if you are parents of seniors? Okay. How many of you are parents of juniors? Sophomores? Freshmen? Grandmother. Grandmother. <laughs> Excellent. Starting early. Senior. Do we have any students in the audience? Excellent. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Um, I have a little slideshow here, but in keeping with the panel, I'm going to forego it. Um, because really, I think what we're, we're all here to talk about, particularly to help you talk about, is finding the best fit for you in your college education. Now, we've talked specifically about finding the best financial fit. We're going to talk a lot about that, and we'll answer your questions. But there are many components of fit as you go through the college search process with your students that are very important. The academic fit, the cultural fit, and so on. Financial fit being one of those. And you have the lucky circumstance of being in New York City and New York State, which has one of the healthiest systems of both private and public higher education on the planet. We have something for everyone, and that would be my first piece of advice to all of you, is to visit our campuses and our colleges. We have a wealth of options at CUNY. We have 25 colleges that you can visit in one university. Uh, we have large colleges. We have small community colleges. We have colleges that are a little more technical in focus. We have colleges that are a little more liberal arts focused. You can have the complete college experience at any one of our campuses, whether you want to be a commuter, live at home, and pursue your degree while you work, whether you want that complete so-called traditional college experience where you live on campus for four years and you soak up what it means to be a college student. You can have that experience at one of our campuses. The same is true for the state university. Uh, the same is true for the over 100 private institutions in the state. I used to work for one of them just up the road. Uh, so I'm going to tell you that you have plenty of options and the best possible way to determine the best cultural and academic fit for you is to visit those campuses. So that's my first piece of advice for you. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about CUNY. How many of you have visited a CUNY campus? Okay, a handful of you. Again, encourage you to visit all of them if you can. I want to tell you about what's new at CUNY and what I think is remarkable about what we offer our students because we've always been focused on value and I will get to the Excelsior Scholarship in a second. One of the first things that I think is remarkable about CUNY is that 80% of our students graduate debt-free. 80%. That's remarkable. 7 in 10 have their tuition covered by federal TAP and Pell grants. 44% of our students are first-generation college students. So we really are a university that serves the men and women of New York City to help them get an education and move on up the social ladder. In fact, we propel six times as many students into the middle class as the Ivy League, Stanford, MIT, and Duke combined. This was reported by the New York Times not too long ago. We're very proud of that. And we also have some world-class academic programs that you should all be aware of. One in particular is our Macaulay Honors Program. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the Macaulay Honors Program? Great. It's a wonderful program. If you want an elite honors program, one of the best in the country, and you want to stay in New York City. We have a new application this year that's important for you to know. Uh, we're very excited about it. It enhances the student experience, gives you some self-service opportunities, uh, and we really do think it's going to make the application process a lot easier. We are offering over $2.7 million in fee waivers in partnership with the mayor's office and the Department of Ed. So again, we're allowing students to access higher ed and take away the barriers of affordability. So you need to know that. As far as financial aid and scholarship are concerned, uh, you should know that there are, and our colleagues have alluded to this, many levels of scholarship and financial aid that are available to you. Simply fill out the FAFSA and the TAP. Uh, 
at the Hess website, and you will have access to all forms of financial aid, whether it's the SAP award, whether it's the federal Pell Grant, whether it's the Excelsior Scholarship. Every college has institution-specific scholarships that you can find. So what I'm telling you is that you shouldn't let a thing like cost, because education does cost, prevent you from applying to any university that you, you think is a good fit for you. There are a few other things that I wanted to mention, um, but I think the most important thing really is to, is to get to your questions. Get to the remainder of our colleagues who have to speak. Because uh, we want to hear from you. I work at the Welcome Center. You can come down and visit me. I'd also like to say that I have some material on CUNY specifically and the financial aid brochure that is very comprehensive. Uh, so you can see me afterward if you'd like to pick that up. Thanks for your time. Happy to be here. With you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Strecker. I'm with uh, Mercy College. Uh, we have a campus here in, uh, in Manhattan as well as in Dobbs Ferry and as well as the Bronx. Um, just given my position in a speaker panel here today, what I thought I'd do is just kind of surmise and recap a little bit of what we're talking about here. Really just kind of pin the three or four different things um, that we are really trying to get across to everyone in the room here as far as how to finance a college, whether it's through the CUNY system, the SUNY system, private school, or God forbid you look outside of New York, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, so what we wanted to start off with, um, as Michael had begun at the very beginning, was really just discuss the TAP program itself, the Tuition Assistance Program from New York State. Um, everybody should fill out a FAFSA form, even if you're unsure, um, even if you don't think that you're going to qualify for, for financial aid, or whatever the case may be, it's a free application. I absolutely recommend wholeheartedly that you fill out a FAFSA application for that academic year. First thing you do. Um, after that, you're going to have the option, you should take it, to fill out the application for the TAP program. That's going to give um, the schools uh, which your students are applying to, it's going to give them an opportunity to review the financial aid information and see how much uh, financial aid can be offered to the student, which is ultimately going to come down and help us all make the right financial decision. We had a we talked a little bit up here about college does cost. Some colleges cost more than others. You need to make sure that we're not putting yourself or you're putting your, your I didn't say your student, your children, um, the students into a position where it's, it's too costly um, in order to go for the degrees or the future that they want to do. So you have to find a happy medium. Um, and the best way to do that is really just go through the federal, the state, um, and especially in terms of the, uh, the private schools, um, institutional money as well. Um, there's a wealth of, um, a wealth of uh, financial resources out there, um, and you really need to just start off with the application, the FAFSA and the TAP applications in order to really go down that road. Um, one of the greatest things about the enhanced tuition or um, the Excelsior program um, that we've seen is that it really is able to move that dollar figure up and really incorporate more families than what we've been able to do with the TAP program to date. So we mentioned before, TAP has a hard cap of about $80,000 um, in an adjusting um, an AGI for each family. So what we're able to do now with the ETA, with the education program, is move that group up to the $120,000 uh, $120, this year. That is a group of families that have essentially been priced out of financial aid um, up until that point. Uh, we have a term that we, we kick around a lot, it's called the <coughs> middle. And these are folks that are making, you know, decent salaries, you're doing good, you can afford to live, you, you, your kid's going to college, all of a sudden you're making too much money to have uh, financial aid. So you don't have quite enough to pay for financial aid, but you're not getting enough financial aid because you're making too much. So what the um, Excelsior program, what the ETA has been able to do is really start providing real power, real, fi um, real funding to those families um, to help them make those decisions. So, uh, we're very excited about that. Um, just speaking a little bit, uh, a little bit more detail about the ETA program versus the Excelsior. They're very, very similar. Uh, there's just the uh, only wrinkle is that the ETA program has a, a dollar cap to it. Um, SUNY and CUNY, it's, it's going to cover the tuition, which is typically about that amount of money. Um, with the enhanced tuition, it's a total of about six thousand dollars per year that will come from the state. And again, that's in concert with TAP, so we kind of need to see where you fall in that spectrum. Uh, but it is, like I said, it's extra money that's out there, and for the people who are in that higher band of, um, of the AGI, 
it's, it's financial assistance, it's free money, that's, that's what we call it, um, that has not been available previously. So we're very excited to, uh, to help our students go ahead and, uh, and uh, receive money through that avenue as well. Okay? We're going to open it up to questions. Um, so if you've been thinking about a great one, we've been looking to, we're looking to give you a good answer. So I think we'll just show the answer. So yes. just so I can understand, the ETA is for private colleges? Yes, the okay. Enhanced Tuition Program is for private schools, and the Excelsior Program is for the SUNY and CUNY. Okay. And where do you get the form for this, uh, for, to apply for this? It's on our website, so uh, there's a handout that was at the table that talks about Excelsior. You see our, our, our name on there, hesc.ny.gov. If the student's a senior, it, um, we sort of have an order of operations where in the fall we have students applying for FAFSA and also the TAP program, which are prerequisites to applying for Excelsior and ETA. And then in the spring, we release the supplemental application for Excelsior and the ETA program. We know students may still be undecided at that point, which school they're going to go to, whether public or private, so you're welcome to apply for both programs. Uh, but by May 1st, which is typically when students need to commit, where they're going to enroll next year, you should let the state know which of the programs you're going to accept based on what school you're going to enroll in. It's a limited application period. I stressed that before when I spoke in the beginning, so we don't give families an unlimited amount of time to apply for ETA or Excelsior. We have to process it. We have to turn it over to the schools so they can do their end of it. So um, it runs typically last year, based on what we did last year, was it ran from March to the end of July, roundabout. So um, you have some time to apply for it, but there'll be families. We have people who called us the first week of class and said, hey, I never applied for Excelsior. Can I still do it? And we said, what rock were you living under for the past six months? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, you have to make sure that um, you get it in on time. So you can't so, apply for any of these now. So, but so one thing you can apply for now, if you have a student, of, if your student's a senior, is the FAFSA. Yeah. You can complete the FAFSA starting October 1st, okay, so you, you can already do that in preparation for completing the Excelsior. And your TAP application at the end of FAFSA, there's a link that start your state application. A lot of people miss that, sometimes because of the design or sometimes just not being able to read the whole page. Uh, sometimes we're guilty of just closing things out. So if you miss that link, your student would be sent a uh, email from higher ed Hopefully they're reading their emails, and it would instruct them how to apply for TAP separate of the FAFSA. Usually comes about three to five days after they file the FAFSA if they didn't use that link to apply for TAP. Yeah, just have your have your grandchild look out for that because okay. um, I remember you said you're a grandparent. Okay. So we we created the and then do application at the end, there will be a link. Yeah, it says start your state application for New York State Student Financial Aid. So, yeah, make sure you read that confirmation. When? There's a lot of good info on that confirmation page. There's your EFC, which we didn't really get into. There's your Pell Grant eligibility. You want to make sure that final page of FAFSA that says congratulations that you read it carefully. Um, and there are there's a link to apply for New York State Aid on there. And that's until the FAFSA. It's going to open October 1st. Open October 1st. Deadlines are set by the colleges. Oh. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so What's the website? For FAFSA, it's yes. FAFSA.gov. FAFSA.gov. So just to be aware about FAFSA. FAFSA.gov. FAFSA.gov. FAFSA FAFSA.gov. I think Mark's going to pop it up on the computer for us. There are some like websites out there um, that, that they say they're federal um, like FAFSA, <coughs> and they cost money. Not real. Do not do it. Okay. FAFSA is free. You should not be paying to, to get aid. Yeah. And when do you do that? In the senior year? Your senior year. Starting the fall, October is when they release the latest application. So with, with the websites that charge, quote unquote, for, uh, for filing FAFSA, what they're doing, the way that it, it's, the way that they present it is they're helping you file. Almost there, uh, there's going to be financial aid nights here. There's uh, financial aid workshops at Westchester Community College. You nice. will get free financial aid help. There's SUNY Financial Aid Day. We will help you for free. You do not need to pay. So just to pause for a moment, we'll go in order of who's raising their hand. So I'll stand by you when it's your turn. So go ahead. So um, I am a single parent. Um, I'm, I'm doing the FAFSA, but my ex-husband is out in another state. Um, what is the um, H AGI for, like, He's not going on to FAFSA. How does that work? All right. Um, if the child is living with you, you use your information. 
if you are receiving child support for you for that child or for anybody else in the household, that is reported under a separate part of the application. Right. But his information is not required, nor is he required to sign the application. This is something we did not cover. Um, everybody, the, both the student and the parent, must create what's called an FSA ID. That is your electronic signature. You're going to want to do that. You can do that as part of the FAFSA. It's not something we can help you with. It's security questions on all of that other stuff. 15, 20 minutes, but it's yours forever, and then you don't have to worry about it again. So my child support ends when she begins college. Gone. It's still so reported. I would okay. talk to the FAFSA. I would talk to the financial it's not office. something that I report on my income yeah. tax. They're going to ask you in 2017, so tax year 2017, did you receive child support? Yep. And to include the child support that was received in 2017 for all of the children in the household. Mm -hmm. well, that goes together with the AGI Correct. to... It's considered untaxed income, so they're going to be looking at that in addition to whatever you make that was reportable on taxes. So that, that's factored in. In my case, it, does, it will put me over the edge then. Oh, well, it, I, it, it depends. <laughs> what I would do is, what I would ask, I would talk to the college that your student wishes to attend and try to get a professional judgment. Uh, but it does need to be reported. Well, there, yeah, so schools can make exceptions. You know, remember, FAFSA is black and white. It says, did you get child support in 2017? You did, so you have to report it. Schools have flexibility within the financial aid office to address situations where there's a one-time income distribution, where you were working last year, but now you're not, you were married last year, but now you're not, and your income is different. The schools can make allowances where they can go in, and they can override the FAFSA and present what your true income situation is. Yeah. But it's done at the discretion of the schools, and you're going to get differences of opinion versus SUNY CUNY private as to what they will adjust. Yes. And, and I'm speaking about Excelsior as well. I mean. Well, Excelsior is AGI, federal AGI. So these are different programs, right? Excelsior says to qualify for Excelsior, does your federal AGI on your 2017 tax return equal or go under 125000 So if child support is not reported on your AGI, okay. then if your AGI on your physical tax return is less than one twenty-five, then your child's going to college next school year, they would qualify okay. for Excelsior. So that doesn't get included. Yeah, you know, FAFSA looks at assets. They look at bank accounts. They can yeah. look at other things. So New York State is reviewing generally adjusted gross income. We don't look at those other things. Uh, well, Mark, where do you get the Macaulay um, you know, uh, application? Is that on a common app? Or how does that work? So the Macaulay application is part of the CUNY application. So we have one application. You just go to the okay. CUNY website. And then when you log into the application, you're going to get three options. You can apply as a general freshman, you can apply as a transfer, you can apply as a Macaulay student. And the deadline is December 1st, uh, but I, I'd suggest that you submit it earlier. Uh, What's the criteria? Like they have to have 100, you know, average So, I mean, the Macaulay is, I mean, obviously looking at a student's application holistically, they have to submit two essays. It's a review by the faculty, the honors faculty, at the college the student selects. So, when you're applying to Macaulay, generally when you're applying to CUNY, one application you can choose up to six college choices. Right? So you select the six college choices you're interested in. CUNY, let's say it's Hunter, Baruch, John Jay, uh, Lehman College, and maybe a, a junior college thrown in there, let's say LaGuardia Community College, right? Well, then in the Macaulay portion of the application, you would select the two college choices that have a Macaulay Honors Program, right? So first the student's going to get reviewed for the college that they've applied to, Macaulay, Hunter, and so on. And then the honors faculty at that college is going to review their Macaulay credentials, their SAT scores, their grades in high school, their essay, their letters of recommendation, and so on, and then make a determination of whether or not they're admitted to Macaulay. Mm -hmm. well, and do you think that it's more heavily weighted on SAT scores or all these other things? Um, now I would say it's a combination of factors. I really would. Um, many of the students have excellent testing. Many of the students have excellent grades, and so you know we're looking at personal statements. We're looking at you know other things to sort of make that final determination. Okay. So your next question: the the application for Excelsior is after the children find out what college they're accepted to. How does it depends if you're if typically the application opens up in the date range where you start hearing back unless your child is doing early action early decision where you already know ahead of time um, you know during the months of March and April are typically <coughs> when you're getting financial aid and admissions replies so 
you could theoretically still be undecided. I mean, if you get accepted to a private school and you know, maybe you get accepted at Mercy, get accepted at Hunter College, you can apply for ETA and Excelsior while you're still figuring out over the next few weeks which one you're going to accept the decision at. So it's um, by May 1st, though, you have to tell us which program they're going to take and which school they're going to enroll in. A lot of times students will list to CUNY that they're going to go to Hunter College. Hunter's very competitive and they end up going to Brooklyn College and they never update their TAP or Excelsior scholarship applications. And then the only time we hear about it from them, because we emailed the student, you know, we didn't get a reply from the school you listed, can you change your school? We'll hear the angry phone call from mom the first week of classes that they don't have your Excelsior scholarship at your child's school. And then we say, save all the anger for your student who we've been emailing for the last four months to come change their application. So you have to make sure you keep us updated if the SUNY or CUNY on the Excelsior form is different than the one that they actually enrolled in um, on or after May 1st. And what else to add? Correctly, the application is specific to, a, to one school? Yeah, what's different between FAFSA and the state application is that FAFSA allows you to enter up to 10 different names of colleges, uni universities, higher education programs. The state does, our, our money is more on a formula that's tied to the school specific tuition rate. So for example, at WCC, they charge less than if they would at a four-year, like at, um, if they were at FIT's four-year program. Yeah. So the TAP or the Excelsior Award would be less at WCC at Westchester Community than it would at Hunter College, which has a four-year tuition rate. Because of that discrepancy, we ask that students give us their top choice of all of these SUNY and CUNYs at the moment in which they're applying, which may be the school that they eventually enroll in, it may not be, so, um, but we only do one school at a time, which at the point when you're applying, should be whatever's still running as the top choice for the student. And same thing for the private. You can, and then if you change your mind, or you find out that you didn't get accepted there, you can ask us to change it. Typically, that would be done in and around May 1st, when you've already committed to a school. All three of these applications that we've talked about, the FAST for the TAP and the Excelsior ETA are free. Um, so when we talk about you know, needing to go ahead and apply for this and apply for that, um, just make sure you understand that these are free applications, and I, I strongly encourage everyone to to fill those out. So when we do FAFSA only, <coughs> which I have a senior um, now, so I'm, I'm planning on filling out the FAFSA, so I should do the TAP and the um, So if you're, first you're going to do your FAFSA, at the end of FAFSA there's going to be a link that says do your state, so it's kind of like taxes, when you do your taxes through your account, you knock out your federal, then you do your state taxes. That's how you're going to approach the first part of this process. Later on, you'll get an announcement, because when you do TAP, we, you, you agree to accept emails from us. You'll get a notification from us saying, hey, Excelsior's out. You know, if you want to apply for that, usually that'll happen in the spring, and then you'll do that. As in, you know, applying for financial aid can be a multi, multiple step process, where you do some things initially. There might be paperwork that you have to send to the financial aid office. Uh, there's going to be things to follow up. We didn't talk about private scholarship money, or you know, sometimes you have to do an institutional aid form for schools. CUNY, they have you do the CUNY supplement. Private schools may require you to do the CSS profile. So there may be other things that you need to fulfill along the way. But typically, the jump off point is the FAFSA and the TAP application. You can do those things now. And that's separate from uh, applying for the school? That you're doing it in conjunction, right? You're doing it at the same time. We know your child's not admitted to college yet. So you're going to be just giving us the names on the FAFSA of the schools that are in the running. You know, it's the six CUNY schools, if you're doing the full six, and the other schools that you consider. The max is 10, though, on FAFSA. But if you're, yeah, you can correct me that. But if you're applying to several schools, um, you would submit the FAFSA with the 10 schools, and then the additional schools you would resubmit the FAFSA. You would just change out some of the schools. Okay. So the school can be coming in from CUNY and private? Right, yeah. 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 Okay, everyone, that's a great question. So just give me a hand when you have a question. So black and white spider here. Um, two simple, quick questions. But for um, living in New York after you finish the Excel, does grad school count? Yeah, so if a student were to, because remember, we're not imposing them right. to do anything specific. Um, if they go to a New York located grad school and they're still living in New York during the time, let's say they go from you know, Hunter College to Columbia Law School, uh, those months and years spent working on the law degree would count as living in New York. They're going to pursue a medical degree. By the time they finish medical plus residency, they can move wherever they want if they did it all in New York. So we count it. If your child doesn't know what they want to do after college, because you've had them in school since they were two years old, and they want to take six months to Netflix and chill on your couch while they're figuring out what's next, <laughs> as long as your couch is located in the great state of New York, they're meeting the Live in New York requirement for the Excelsior Scholarship. So we're not telling them to do anything other than maintain their New York residence. And once you lose it, 
it's done. If you move for six months and move Well, no, if you need a temporary break, right? Like if you're saying, look, I got accepted not to Columbia Law, but to Harvard Law School, you can up, 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 apply for a postponement. We'll say, okay, how long do you need? And then we'll give you nine months after, we'll give you the time you need plus nine months to come back and reestablish. And then we'll resume the live in New York criteria. It's only the point where you say, forget New York, I'm tired of this nasty weather, I'm moving to California. Um, that would then trigger the, um, you know, quote unquote penalty of having to, um, we'll recalculate, well, how long did you stay in New York? And you can keep that portion of the scholarship, but the portion of the scholarship that you didn't earn to keep because you didn't stay the full time, we would then make arrangements with the student to pay that back. Zero interest, zero fees, zero penalties, basically just the original amount, and we give them up, up, up to 10 years to make arrangements to pay that back. It's so only the Excelsior amount. Only the Excelsior amount, which is not inclusive of the tuition credit, or if you were getting so TAP plus Excelsior, it would only be the Excelsior amount. If somebody traveled for six months after school and then came back to work, yeah, you can notify us that it's here yeah. because they're just traveling. Just notify it. us that you're doing it and that you're going to leave the state temporarily and that you'd like a postponement. You know, maybe grandma down in Tennessee. My grandma's in Tennessee. She might get sick and I got to go take care of her. I need, you know, six months. We'll say, okay, we'll give you that plus a little bit of a grace period. Um, they can apply for a postponement. We're really not trying to penalize young folks. But we didn't create the Excelsior Scholarship to benefit the future population of Florida, right? We didn't create this to benefit the future workforce of the state of New Jersey. It's really meant for New York to build on the New York population as a benefit to all of us and, and you know, for the, the, the higher purposes that were explained before. Right? And does anything need New York state tax return or is everything federal? So some of our programs look at state AGI, like TAP will require you to report off of your IT-201. Uh, Excelsior is particularly written for the federal AGI, so you need to have both on hand, depending on which one you're applying to. FAFSA is just federal. FAFSA is just federal, but TAP is looking at state numbers, but Excelsior is looking at federal numbers. So yeah, it's it really de it depends on how the state legislature is. So the enhanced program. one is also state. Similar, everything with, we speak TAP. about when I say Excelsior, you can okay. replace the word Excelsior with ETA. They're mirrored programs, except in the dollar amount, and that the money goes to private schools, not SUNY and CUNY. There's um, a limited. There's a participant. Uh, there's a participation that schools have to agree with. So not every single private school in New York offers ETA, uh, but many of them do, and we list those schools on the application for ETA. You'll see that the schools that are options. And the AGI is the same. Everything's the same with Excelsior. 125 under okay. that with ETA. There. You can interchange the words. Yeah. This is a bit up here. Yeah, we'll go here and then here. Here. Okay. You all forget. Um, actually, I wanted to find out if a person is receiving social security disability mm -hmm. and they make less than twenty-five thousand. How is that? Somebody said in the past that you're not supposed to report it, or you're supposed to report it. How is that? Yeah, Social Security benefits are only reported if they're taxable. So we would see it like if you know you're disabled, but your spouse works. That's the Feds have a tax requirement as about combining well, it with their income. Parent, that's the only yeah, if you're a low-income parent that subsides just off Social Security benefits, you probably don't file or didn't file a tax return. In which case, filing FAFSA will be a breeze. But you know, it's easy to say on FAFSA, I didn't work, I didn't do taxes. You know, my colleague at WCC is going to put you through a process called verification. Yeah, we are. Yes. On. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so they're going to be, yeah. yeah, they're going to they're going to say, well, how do you live, right, off of zero income with no taxes? And you're going to show them, I guess, Social Security disability, and you know, there's worksheets they have you fill out. For the state purposes, you don't have an AGI, so you report your income as zero. Um, you won't need Excelsior because you'll be the beneficiary of a full TAP award, which will give you free tuition through that lesser known now program called TAP, which has been around for a long time exactly designed to help families like yours to be able to afford city, state, and private schools, you'll be guaranteed a TAP award if, if that's your financial situation. They don't expect you to use your social security checks to pay for college. And what about, you know, the child support portion? I mean, so that's going to get snagged in verification, right? The FAFSA is designed that if you say, I didn't work, I didn't have an income, I didn't file taxes, they give you this very wonderful option to skip the remainder of the questions, mm -hmm. in which case they put the onus on the college financial aid offices to then verify what resources do you get in the household, which would include child support, social security. Yeah. Uh, it, a lot of it depends on um, the public versus the private schools, because if the private schools are giving away their own money, they're going to look at your uh, family financial situation with a mu much more closely than than a community college or a SUNY or CUNY would. We all are going to put you through verification. You're going to say, I received this much in, in uh, child support, and I received this much in disability. 
chances are, unless you're receiving an extremely high level of child support, understood, uh, that you're not, then it's not going to matter. What I would suggest you do is that you already know that it's there, you already know that you need to answer that question. Do not skip those questions. Answer to child support, the information will be correct when you are selected for verification. You don't need to be corrected, you get your aid right away. You still have to report the, if you were married, the father, you know, put his financials, if there's no communication with them? No, you just have to put down what child support you receive. We don't need any other, any of his social security number or name or anything else like that. Does that, would that require, would that um, make him, like, would that, like you, you mentioned he up, seek, those pro programs that are so, um, for low income? So if you're in, in a significant financial need, um, there is a chart that you can look for online, so SUNY EOP or CUNY C or CD, if you Google it, as well as the HEOP, they'll show you a list of numbers um, ranging from the, the, income, the household size that corresponds with income. If you hit that number um, in, or below, you qualify. So the admissions requirement for that specific school is actually lower. Um, so that, and they give you additional support, so they'll give you stipends for textbooks, um, they'll help you pay for, for meal plans or housing, depending on the institution. And they, they have to have both, the GPA has to be low and the income? It has to be both? So the, the main focus is the income. Okay. Um, and then you can look at the GPA requirement, because you can potentially get into um, a school that's academic requirements are much higher than uh, for a traditional student. Okay. And if they have a disability, would they be able to get both? Would they be able to... Get the, you know, the EOP or whatever they go into plus help they're disabled? So the, the, some people confuse like the um, opportunity programs with like these access programs for students with disabilities. They're not the same thing. The state provides allowances for um, the removal of the full-time study barrier for ADA eligible students. Um, you know, so you would just notify your college at CUNY, the Accessibility Office, or the Office of Students with Disabilities, however they name it, at whatever school, and the student has to basically go through their process of being identified. In New York, for Excelsior, for example, we would say, look, you don't need to do the 30. For ADA students, we say, whatever you take, just pass. If you're going to take one class, we'll pay for it with Excelsior, but pass it. You know, get a D or whatever the minimum passing grade is, and then you can go to school at your own pace, so that way there's no... If a student has a learning disability or something of that nature, there's no uh, restriction to make them do a higher level amount of coursework that, that students um, without a disability are required to do. No, but my question was, if they're in SEEK or HEOP or one of those programs, can they still get support services with the school disability you know, yes. program yes. in addition? Yes, yes. yes. absolutely. Sure. Yeah. So they could have both as a support system. Correct. Yeah. Okay. The, the academic support that you would get from, say, EOP is different than the accommodations you would receive as a student with a disability. And when do you have to apply for that? Like, you have to document to have everything and, and you have to go to the disability, you or the, the student actually, has to go to the disabilities office and say, hi, I have this from my high school, I need a plan. That, that office reports to me on my campus. I, we usually suggest once you're admitted and once you deposit and you know you're coming, start talking over the summer. Uh, also because in the transition from high school to college, um, IEPs don't automatically go over and sometimes you need new testing or different things and so the office will work with you and you never want a student to get to November when they're now in the academic difficulty and go, oh, I guess now, and then you take a few more weeks to get so it's better when proof. Before they so get absolutely, that. exactly. And then there's a signing thing that they said that they want to give access to the parents to get information. Mm -hmm. yeah. We do, we have, a, we have FERPA forms as well, so I do. Is that what it's for? Yeah. yeah. The, where the parent can advocate or, or Correct. get information. You, you currently, under FERPA K-12, through as parents, grandparents, guardians, you all have the right to your children's records right, right now. But the minute part. they enroll in higher ed, that changes to the student. And as a parent, you don't necessarily have that. It also helps them learn to adult, so as I say, so it's not a bad thing. But if you're helping support your child, I always say in my admissions thing, you hold the purse strings. So with my children, it was like, where are the grades? Print them out. We want to see them. And just, you know, kept that communication open. So it is different. But we do have that opportunity, particularly in areas like financial aid, as well as um, disability services, where it's really a team effort between the parent and the student. So we'd like you to be the support system and making sure they're doing it as they go. Right. FERPA? FERPA, the 
I always get it wrong. The family ed federal? Oh, no, family, 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 family education. education. Rights and Privacy Rights Act. Rights and Privacy Act. Yeah. Yeah. F-E-R-P-A. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. And also, if the child has a disability, look at the state program access VR. Um, there's some monies that they may be entitled to that help with the cost of higher education. State access VR? Yeah, well? New York State access VR. Like, just the letters VR, access VR. Yes, as in victory VR. As in reality, yeah. Um, yeah, so. Um, New York State VR. Yeah, the access VR. Access VR. New York State access, access VR. Access VR, yeah. Just Google that, that, it'll come right up, and you can look at the um, right, programs you. they get for higher education. So just to add real quickly, so that happens after you get enrolled, right. um, but if you're doing the opportunity program, it has to happen um, when you're applying. So there's an indicator on the application that you would check off, yes, I qualify for EOP, or yes, I qualify for SEEK, or, H uh, or EOP, and um, then the school would do verification for you afterwards. Okay, and that, that's, that would be any, if there are any CUNY, it's like, it's not on the actual so admission you, application, it's on the, um, when you um, do the classes, and then you... So have, when you're applying for CUNY, uh -huh. uh, you would say yes. I want to be uh, I want to be considered for CEEK or CD. Mm -hmm. um, there's like a little box you check for the SUNY app. There's something that says yes. I want to be qualified for EOP. And on the Common app, there's something for HEOP and EOP. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Miss in blue. If you uh, make a mistake after you see your you did not apply for the Excelsior scholarship, mm -hmm. and then you already start college, yep. would you be able to be qualified for your second year of college or not? You can reapply for Excelsior at any point. Um, you have to renew, we didn't speak about renewing financial aid forms, so you have to renew um, your FAFSA, renew your TAP, and also Excelsior needs to be renewed. Um, during that period of either renewal or new applications, students who are currently in school are welcome to submit an application to request it for that year. But if you're catching, if you're picking up Excelsior midstream, you have to be meeting the spirit of the on-time graduation requirement, meaning that if you already did one year of college this year, now you're trying to get it for next school year, you should have 30 credits on the books, right? Um, from the, you know, before the fall of, if you started this fall, before the fall of the next year starts, you should have 30 credits on the books, and the school would verify that. There's an exchange of information between higher ed and the, each individual campus that, that does Excelsior, and they report, yes, the student's here with us, Yes, they have their 30 credits. We get that and we say, good, we can move forward with the rest of the process. And you also say that after your four years, you cannot move to any other state because if you do so, you're going to penalize you? Yeah, so it's during the, so let's say you did, you got free tuition for four years. You have to, at minimum, stay in New York for four years after that, right? Um, after the four years of living in New York, you've met the requirement for us. We hope you wouldn't, but you could leave. Um, it's up to the student. This requirement's only on the student, so the parents don't have to also stay in New York after their kid graduates college. The student is the one who has the responsibility to stay in New York. How about if the kids start and then can't figure out yet what kind of major they want and then they want to take a break? What's going to happen? So they can apply for an approved leave of absence if they're an Excelsior recipient. So um, at the, this happens at SUNY, it happens at CUNY a lot where students will give themselves their own version of an approved leave of absence, which means go to their CUNY first, withdraw from all their classes, and then hope everything figures itself out. Sometimes you end up with a bill after doing that. Um, so you want to make sure that if the student is having issues with classes, that there's a proper way of getting yourself a leave of absence or asking for support if you're about to withdraw and ask what happens if I withdraw. So where do you go? Do you go to the financial aid place or what? You can give usually financial aid, registrar, like there's different offices within the college where the student would have to Financial aid is probably universally a good place to start. Yeah. Uh, uh, if that's yes. not the ultimate destination, mm -hmm. your financial aid counselor will be able to help you with the next step. Yeah. Okay. Just make sure your kid doesn't hit that eject button without you knowing what's going on. If I, if I oh. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there are differences between the academic um, the academic considerations and the financial aid considerations where in some cases where one office will say one thing and one office will say the other it's just like you want to keep your money you're gonna to have to do this but an academic advisor may say well it's probably a better idea to withdraw I'm gonna sit in my office in fact I did it today and say you're gonna to need to stick around and you're gonna to need to try a little bit longer you know because I had a student uh, to give you a specific example I had a student the second week of class, she dropped all her classes. She never talked to anybody. And she's screaming at me because she's going to owe money. And I'm like, you're going to owe all this money. You're going to lose all the financial aid associated with it. And I can't fix that. 
And once you drop, you can't get back into your classes. Yeah. It's, it's not like, oops, we'll just add you back in. You've missed school. You, yeah. You're done for that semester. So always, always remember. Very important. Yeah, I'm, have from, conversations. From an academic perspective, remember that the professors hold an enormous degree of power. If you miss too many classes and they don't want to let you back in, they don't have to, That's correct? Right. Correct. Okay. Yes, uh, I have uh, just two, two questions. Talk about the AGI. My, if you're self-employed, what line would that be on the 1040? 37 it's, on a 1040. It's line 37. Okay. It's, the, it's the last. It's the last line on the front page. And I have one other question. You keep on talking about the 30 credits. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got it, but I'm assuming that you can do that. 30 credits is a normal course schedule load. Yeah. Okay. CUNY actually, this was one of the big spots where CUNY and SUNY were able to say that their rate of 15 or 30 credit pursuing students increased because of the, you know, the direct effect of the Excelsior program. Okay. It's possible, it's just I think it's become a thing where your kid goes from high school having to take X amount of classes on a set schedule to going to college and told you could take Fridays off. And now they decide that they don't want to take a Friday class, which they might need to take to get them their 15 oh, credits. But it's so. to be like Typically five being, classes a semester. Yeah. What? Five classes in the fall. At three hours well, of class, five right? classes. You're paying five for eighteen in the spring, right? So that's thirty. So it's right so it's only three. It's only three credits per class. Yeah, and then you just on average. Really, on average, it's about three, three credits per yeah. class. And that thirty per year keeps you on track to graduate within four years. What you don't want to do is is kick that over to that next half year. Or another full year, right. the cost of college. Now that I got, I just yeah, and there is some flexibility for special programs. So, like, there's some, you know, uh, adjusting we needed to do. Like, there's, um, you know, Practice specifically testing. tracked programs, like a nursing program, where they can't take a certain course until they reach a certain milestone, or it's only offered in second term. The state is aware of this, as you know, we're learning. Excelsior is not a program that's been around for 40 years like that. It's only been around roughly a year, um, so um, a year or more. So we're just um, working with those exceptions to say, look, if a student can't actually take 30 this year because the course isn't available, they will allow the student to continue with the program for those programs that have that sort of structure. Yeah. I have a few questions. Um, for the uh, Excelsior program, you mentioned there's certain colleges you have to put in that you're applying to. And what, how many uh, do you say? You want to take this? Ten per faster. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, ten per Basically, it, it, what it is is okay. that you're putting in your personal, private information. Your names, your dates of birth, social security numbers, stuff that you do not want out just given to anybody. Right. You have to give FAFSA, the Department of Education, permission to share that information with a specific school. And, so the schools, I mean, uh, well, my, my grandson is in Long Island, so he's, he wants to stay in Long Island. But uh, can you also apply uh, a food in the FAFSA uh, New York City? Can you go to New York City to CUNY? Absolutely. And can you also, let's say, pick a college in Boston? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah absolutely. So you can put, I mean, not just SUNY or CUNY, yeah. but you can for the FAFSA. The FAFSA is federal for the yeah. entire country. That's for the entire country. In Hawaii to Maine and oh, Washington okay. so to, to Florida. Florida. Okay. If I may, though, if I may make one suggestion for your grandson. Yes. If he has a specific college in mind in New York State, that should be the first college listed because that's the school, that information is given to TAP, is directly forwarded to TAP. So if he, like, say, wants to go to SUNY Farmingdale, that's the college that should be listed first so that the, when the TAP application is completed, it will have SUNY Farmingdale's code already entered. You can change it very easily, but it's just more convenient. Uh, what we have found out with Excelsior is that a student wanted to go to, say, SUNY Oneonta, couldn't afford it because they couldn't afford the housing, came to WCC, changed it on the FAFSA, never changed it for the state. Where's my Excelsior? Well, they said you're going to Oneonta. Oh, okay, I'll change it 24 hours later. We get their approval and they're all set. It's just an extra step that you don't have to do. Okay, and I'm not too familiar with New York City colleges, but I'm not limited to New York City residents, are they? No. Or can, can, can state residents also apply? Yes. Yes. Okay, because I wanted to ask about the Sunny Fair at Javits Center, and I went there, and I got a lot of information. There was nothing about CUNY there. Right. So I, I went to so the yeah. colleges where in the city. Yeah. So, we're two, we're two different systems yeah. that support each other. So there's four school, SUNY schools in the city. As long, and a number in Long Island as well. 
but they are two different. So you have to get the information from CUNY and the information from SUNY. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was, those are my questions. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Here. So for for you, um, the ar for example, architecture is a five usually a yeah. five year program. Yep. How would you know that when I apply to your program? So um, that's something that the schools would report to us. So we have like kind of a back end system where the schools are um, verifying enrollment and they're telling us what type of program the student's in. So they can flag it to us that they're in an approved five-year program, we would call that, where we know they need 150 instead of 120 credits, and then that would then give us the um, ability to extend Excelsior to an additional year if it's a five-year like accounting program, or to know if there's like some sort of um, issue. Some of these things aren't reportable where the schools would have to contact us and through back channels they let us know there's a sequencing issue where they where we can't give Excelsior and we would basically advise the schools okay you can let it pass through so we work closely with our school partners to make sure that we're exchanging the information needed so it doesn't affect your child so that way the student's not saying well I can't get Excelsior so we make sure in the background that we coordinate that way um, the child doesn't experience you know an issue of having to be on a line wondering why they didn't get their Excelsior scholarship because something wasn't flagged. We do a pretty good job at, um, at, at working together to make sure that HESC and the schools make that happen. Okay, do you have an answer to the question? Here, go ahead. Hey, a student question. Awesome. What do you, I want to I want, uh, apply to like a college, like a rural college, for example, and then I want to get to a financial program. Like, will the Excelsior program, like, Scholarships for me. Like so yeah, so you're, you're probably thinking of study abroad, right? Like mm -hmm. kind of where you do a semester. The answer is as long as it's an approved program through Baruch, through CUNY, um, not something that you found online that they're not affiliated with, but something that's approved through them, you could get Excelsior. Excelsior would only give you what it would traditionally give you at the school, though. So if you're going to Europe and you want to study in Italy and it's going to cost you 50,000 euros, you're not going to get a 50,000 euro Excelsior, Excelsior scholarship for that. Um, you're just going to get the amount you would have gotten for that semester uh, applicable towards your program. So, but it is allowed. You can do study abroad. Now, one thing, if your study abroad is a glorified vacation uh, where you're not going to earn credits during that time, you could lose your Excelsior after you come back from your happy time abroad when your school evaluates what you did and they say, wait, all of these classes like visiting the Tower of Pisa and going to the museums, um, we can't put that anywhere in their program you could end up falling off the track to graduate. So make sure that if you do do an, an abroad program that you're actually taking credits that come back with you. And, and all schools have a study abroad office with advisors who make sure students understand that, as well as cluing in the financial aid office to help you understand what other resources beyond Excelsior are there to make sure that you can have this experience. Most pretty much all institutions are really committed to helping students get an international experience if they want one. May I, may I make a, a, another comment to tag and have, group, hang on to that. Um, the college courses that you're talking about for study abroad program, and this is true for all classes, for you to receive financial aid at Excelsior, you must those colleges, those courses must apply to your program. So it isn't enough to say, well, I'm going to go study art in, say, Italy, when in fact you don't need any art courses to complete your degree. You can take it as long as you're taking enough other courses, but that would be very hard to schedule with it with an international uh, study abroad experience. And that's true for everything, especially with Excelsior, if your classes must apply to your degree. Your advisor should be making sure of that. If you have any questions, speak to your academic advisors to make sure you're on the right track. Yes, I was actually one more time. With the Excelsior, doesn't my daughter is interested in PT, physical therapy. Mm -hmm. There's a six-year program at Quinnipiac. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, so I'm going to apply. It's, it's not in New York. So it's not. So it's only, yeah. only New York State. Yeah, right. I thought I was going to get the uh, Connecticut gets New York state aid myth, that's like an urban legend, that you can go to school in Connecticut and New York will give you Excelsior and stuff for that. Nope. Yeah. For New York State residents taking college courses in New York. Yeah. It also applies to the private schools in New York. Enhanced tuition award is meant for private schools, Excelsior is meant for SUNY and CUNY, but then TAP is flexible to both. 
We have a STEM incentive scholarship that's flexible to both now. It used to be exclusively for SUNY CUNY. So yeah, programs, you just have to know which specific program applies where, but yeah. Only New York. When is the application available again? For Excelsior and everything? Um, they will be offered in the spring. Last year's dates was March through the end of July. You can fill out the preliminary steps, right, which is to do your FAFSA, to do your TAP application, which a lot of people forget to do. Um, and then when those are set, you'll get an email from us indicating that Excelsior is available, and then you can apply for it separately. I just want to I just want to emphasize a point that we've been making, and, and Michael's been making quite a bit, that there are a number of other supports, tremendous supports financially, than Excelsior. And I'm going to give you an illustration of what that looks like. This last year, for the first round of Excelsior scholarships, 24,000. CUNY students applied for the Excelsior Award. Just over 5,000 of the students got some money as part of the Excelsior Award, right? That's a big gap. Does that mean the other students didn't qualify for the award? No. What it means is that they had their tuition covered by federal grants and state grants and other tuition awards given by the school. So they didn't need Excelsior money to get free tuition. Right? So there's a whole host of other resources available that Excelsior, and that's important to know because you can apply for those a lot earlier than you can apply for the Excelsior Award. Excelsior Award is a great thing for people who qualify and need it, mm -hmm. but you know, it's not everything that's available for students, so you know that. You mentioned Pell Grants at one point. What are Pell Grants? Pell Grants are federal grant program. Um, the they are grants or federal. federal. Yes. Federal. 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 No, I'm sorry, you said Pell, right? Yes. And how do you uh, apply for those? Through the FAFSA. Through the FAFSA. The Pell Grant. Through the what? FAFSA? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Those are also like uh, inquiring at a high, high, very, very high score. I need. No, yeah, it's not based on grades. It's not based on grades. Yeah, it's just based on an analysis of your income, a needs oh, analysis. Yeah. What about the merit scholarship? <laughs> right, so I think she was trying to ask a question. Oh, I don't know. Okay. It's all right. Uh, all I wanted to ask, and this is kind of bizarre, I won't qualify for anything other than perhaps Excelsior. Do you have any other ideas besides just Excelsior? Because enhanced tuition, if you're going to a $60,000 school, getting five doesn't really help. Yeah. Well, I know, but it doesn't <laughs> yeah. help enough. I mean, right. Well, there's also institutional funds that most right. private colleges are going to offer. There's also scholarships, so it really depends on what school you're going to. Um, again, I would always say fill out the FAFSA, let the schools yeah, let the yeah. schools work that out and, and help Th you. That's why you want to do this process early because it allows us as schools to package you and write to you in April and May and say this is how much money we can give you. And then apply. You do this before you apply. You start the FAFSA now. Right. While we're applying to college. Right. And then, as students get to January and say, these are the schools I really want to go to, you readjust your FAFSA if those schools aren't on it. Okay. And then what we are doing as schools in, for me at least, at FIT, for January, February, March, we are gathering all the information as it comes in from the various organizations. We put together a letter that says, this is how much money and what we can help you with. And it'll have, and when you get an award letter, it should have everything on it. It'll have what scholarships the school's going to offer you, whether you get Pell, it'll have Excelsior, it should have some tap on it. It'll give you an idea of how much you can pay. And just one more thing, I had a, two sons who have gone through college and recently graduated. One went to a private school and one went to a public school. The amount of institutional aid my student got at the private school <coughs> made the cost of that tuition, which was I think $28,000 more than the public school, both kids came out exactly the same. So it, you really have to go through this process so you can see, because he just went to a school that happened to award him, for whatever reason, they liked him, a bigger package than maybe some other kid got. So, yeah. There are so, also external scholarships that you can stack on top of like, the aid and the merit-based scholarships. So one thing, we have a lot of really great questions, and we have a permit for this space for about 15 more minutes. So we're going to take one more question. And then our panelists will be here for a few minutes afterwards. So if you have a more, you know, individualized question or something like that, you can refer to them. So you can this is just a quick question on the um, FASA. Um, when we're submitting the tax information, 
and we have to put the parent. The parent has to, the child that is applying for financial aid, the parent, we have to prove that that child was a dependent of that parent. Yeah, your, the rules for federal is that your child is your dependent, mm -hmm. even if they live with you or not, um, if, under the age of 24. So if your child lives with you and you're claiming them on taxes, then we would traditionally expect that you're giving them their, or you're helping them. FAFSA is a student parent application, so you know you would be putting your information on there as their, as their parent. Um, even if they're 18, even if they're 19, even if they're 21, remember, there's no automatic age of being an adult. Some people say, oh, my child is 18, they're an adult. Well, go have them buy some uh, beer for me at the you know, grocery store and we'll see whether they're an adult or not. There's different age requirements. The state, um, we consider automatic independence at 36 mm -hmm. if they're still dependent on you financially. So we're looking at who's supporting the young person. So in the event that both parents are supporting, but one parent is not getting child support? Um, well, remember the custodial parent rule. If you're the, if your child, you're a single parent, you live with your child, you're the, the child lives with you the majority of the time, you're the only parent that's representing your income. If child support is wishy-washy, you just report whatever you got as best as you can for last year. Um, if it was zero, zero was an answer. I didn't get child support last year. So maybe there's an arrears for child support or something like that. The schools are going to do their best to work with your individual situation. And if they go through verification, then they'll just tell you what's acceptable to verify your situation. And you just report your income the best you can. If the non-custodial parent is not in your household, they don't need anything from them for this federal and state process. What right? if a non-custodial, what if a, the non-custodial income is being used for FAFSA? So there's an issue we always get asked where who should be filing the FAFSA, the parent that the student lives with or the parent who claims the student on taxes. Sometimes it's not the same person, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, there's a divorce or separated situation where you have two kids, you claim one of the kids who's younger not going to college as an older kid that um, the other parent's claiming just for purposes of having dependence on your taxes or whatever. Sometimes we see divorce or separation agreements that mandate that you split the exemptions. For the us, we go back to the first rule. Where, which parent does this child live with most of the time? Is it with you or is it with them? If Even if they're on their taxes, even if that child is on grandma's taxes, we're going under you, the parent, that's the custodial parent of that child. So, so if, if the parent so if a parent puts their, in, their income on a FAFSA that did not claim that child that the other parent claimed, mm -hmm. how, would, how would you guys verify that that child lived with the other, that parent? Yeah, that the, didn't the onus is on you to represent that, right? So you're going to say, I am, when you sign FAFSA, there's an agreement up front and there's an agreement at the end that I'm providing the accurate information to the best of my knowledge under the you know, penalty of law mm -hmm. that this is what I'm saying. And when FAFSA says, you say, I'm divorced or separated, they say, well, which parent does the student reside with most of the time? You're going to say, mom, that that's legal and true in fact. Mm -hmm. Now, if your child gives me, like, um, your address for FAFSA, puts dad's address for TAP, and then does the Common app or the CUNY app with another address, yeah. you're probably going to go through verification yeah. because we're like, what is going on? Where does this child live? Yeah. Um, you know, so we sometimes will freeze the process if we see that there's so many discrepancies that, um, you know, that they just, it needs to be clarified. Sometimes we can reject your application outright, you know, if we feel like there's some kind of illegal or misrepresentation of your situation. Mm -hmm. um, Typically, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. This is extreme circumstances. You yeah, I was, I was trying to get a, an idea in, in the case that the both parents are not married, have never been married, yep. co-parenting, yeah, one well, parent co claims a child. Yeah, if you cohabitate, co that's a different story. Perhaps has a yes, Like you status. said, in some cases, a, a child will live with a parent, but the other parent will Yeah, as long claim as you are not living together, right? They have a status that says if you live together but are not married, they collect mm -hmm. both your incomes. Mm -hmm. yeah, but right. if you don't live together, then that's the deciding factor. Okay. Who does your child live with, right. mom or dad? Okay. And does your child's income, if the child works in yeah. your senior year of high school, yeah. what happens to that income? Well, remember, it's not senior year of high school income. It's going to okay, be 2017. Yes. Let's say 
Yeah, it, counts. Your, your it counts. It yeah, counts. Yeah, it'll be reported if it was reported. Like if your kid, you know, gets a W two from doing summer youth through the city yeah. in twenty seventeen. Yeah. There's a line off that so that even if you say they didn't do taxes, it said did they have any wages from or earnings from work? What about the Excelsior? Yes, we're right. going to ask to report total income of the student and the parents in the household. What if they didn't get? But it then it wouldn't be on. So you have to show two tax returns. You, if they, my they, daughter works, she earned two thousand dollars, and she paid tax. She filed the tax. She filed the yeah, so she so has an AGI. So you're, you're going to add her AGI yes. plus your AGI. AGI. Yeah. Even if they didn't get a W, because if a child is still clean out of dependent, they don't get a W two. They do get a W two. Um, it's just that they may not be required to file taxes if they don't hit the federal limit on on earned income for a claim dependent. So like last year, I think it was like sixty three hundred. Like if they earn more than six thousand three hundred from working, they had to do a tax return whether you claim them or not. Um, but most young people, like you said, earn a thousand or two thousand dollars. They get a W two or a ten ninety nine. Well, ten ninety nine is a different story. But uh, W two, they don't have to file taxes with that. Some mm -hmm. people do. Some people don't. Just make sure your child wasn't in that range where you know uh, that they should have filed. If they get a 1099, that's a whole different thing. They consider self-employed. The IRS wants you to file a tax return if you earn more than $100 of self-employed income. So they want you to do a Schedule C. It's a whole, it's a whole mess. Talk to financial aid. Yeah, yeah. they'll, they'll yeah. guide you. If they see on the facts so that you're reporting income that should have been claimed on taxes, mm -hmm. they'll hit you with the verification hammer. Okay. Yeah. There okay. have been so many valuable questions. Thank you for all for coming. A lot of this information is in writing on our resource table. The experts will be here for a moment longer. Let's take a moment to thank our experts. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out tonight.